Okay. Hello, I'm Stefan. Sorry for the delay. Uh, not used to uh, this kind of presentation yet. So we'll see how that goes. Um, quick introduction. Uh, then we'll go over in teacher types. So this will be more uh, of an advanced talk. Um, our MC kindly has uh, an eye on the chat. So please uh, enter your questions there. And then we'll go through some examples and it will be like, yeah, why do we care into like the nitty gritty details into an actual application? How can we use that in Rust? And yeah, so uh, about me, I am currently studying at uh, my master's, started with Rust uh, five years ago. I'm also organizer of RustFest, give some talks every now and then. Um, if you want to watch the RustFest talks, you can do so at uh, watch.rustfest.global or in a couple of weeks, maybe less, you can watch them on YouTube on your favorite Rust uh, channel. So what's the topic today? Uh, we have to differentiate between memory and symbol. What's a symbol? What's variable? What's a register? What are atomic operations? And what's the visibility problem? And also, what is a CPU cache? Uh, why do we have it? Um, what is a cache line? Before we begin, yes. Most people come up to me and are like, yeah, Rust is pretty cool, but it's too slow. And I'm just like, have you tried release mode? So that's uh, one thing um, that gives you a speed boost of at least factor two, usually factor 40, sometimes even more. And um, that's important because you don't have to optimize, right? You just tell the compiler, do it, do optimize for me. Um, another thing I like to run is Cargo Watch. You can see it on the second line, uh, Cargo Watch uh, watches all the files in your project. It watches the source and static and all the other folders. And whenever you change one, it waits a little bit, I think it's 0.5 seconds or something, then it runs these X commands. And these are equivalent to you typing in cargo check, cargo of FMT for format and cargo run. And of course you can uh, add quotes around the run and then it's run dash dash release in quotes and it will run in release mode. Why is that important? Uh, link time is really bad in Rust still. So if you have a huge project with like 300, 400 dependencies, which you get to that point really fast if you use Actix as a web framework and maybe some image libraries for image processing, then you have another image generation library for the least little fancy icons. And then you have a database and maybe database pool and uh, maybe some web socket handling and whatnot. And then after all that, there's your game logic. That's like 300 crates into the build process. So cargo check is really fast because it does not link your project. It checks the syntax, it checks most of the types and then it tells you if you're okay or not. And um, that's great. Format keeps your code clean in the sense that it has one kind of format. That's really great for working together with people. Uh, there's nothing worse than looking at someone's code and, and just not having a feel for where the control flow is going just because they uh, have some uncommon uh, indentations and whatnot. Uh, if you're coming from C-like languages or JavaScript where uh, brackets are optional around the if or the for loops or the while loops, then you know what I mean. It, it's horrible, right? Because someone can write stuff like if, for, and then one statement, semicolon, and then another in one line. And then you have to remember that the last one is not included in the if or the for loop. It leads to really, really dirty bugs. Uh, Moving on, so so why do we care about atomics? Uh, I've given you here uh, an LS topo of uh, my machine. It has uh, 24 gigs of memory, um, four cores with two compute units, and 
you see it's pretty powerful and that's a laptop. So to make problems solvable, we need a lot of uh, compute power and Python is great for, for teaching algorithms and whatnot. But when it comes down to raw compute performance, we want to be able to leverage all these eight cores or whatever we have. I mean, I've worked on systems with 128 cores. So it would be a shame if you only use one or two of them. So how many times do we need integer data? I mean, most people think like, yeah, we'll work with strings or tables and databases, but you can do a lot with integer data. Um, one of the big things is counting stuff or indexing stuff. So even if, if we work with strings, indexes have an impact. If we have multiple objects in a, in a list, in an array, or in a vector, we need to be able to calculate these indexes fast and have fast access to the stuff. So this is a quick question. And let's see if we can make this work. I will try to open the chat myself. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Rust lint. So I, I don't think I've seen any suggestions where will the index be stored. So let's resolve that. Um, this is the, these are the answers. So the index is size. It's not on the stack. Thank you, Vladimir. Just seen you. Index has type u size because that's where uh, the data index brackets that forces the type into u size. And because we operate on an index level, it actually lives in RSP. It's a register. So that symbol does not have a memory address at runtime. And because LLVM is pretty cool, um, the data will get analyzed. By data, I mean the program code will be analyzed. And then the compiler decides, oh, it's just four loops, right? It can determine that it's just four loops from that control flow. And it will say, too bad, we will unroll that. So you don't see this loop in the assembler anymore. And that's pretty powerful. We don't have to care. If we run this on a really small ARM machine, this will give, give us a huge improvement because it doesn't matter what the ARM machine is. There's no more index calculations. It's just like jumping into the fields and reading it out. Hmm, where's my moving? There we go. So, so what happens if we want to watch um, a value from another thread, like something is happening over here and we want to watch it and react to it. So let's make a scenario. So we have two threads, a counter and a watcher. And these, we will set these up with the control thread that's running in the main function. And it's basically what it says there. The counter will just loop around. It will count from zero to 99. And the watcher thread will try to count um, how many times does it change? Like every time the value changes, it will uh, increment itself and it will record to us how many times it was able to observe the same value. And one would e expect to have this one-to-one -one correlation, right? Because this one increments by one, this one sees it and also adds one and follows suit. So this is our code. Uh, if you have been using Rust a lot, uh, you probably see the, um, the notes here. This is directly from the example. Um, so you can run this code uh, after the talk. The last, last example I have to upload still, so that one will be available soon after. Uh, unsafe, as I wanted to say, is, is here. This is a, is a sign that you have to be really, really careful and you should add a note why this unsafe is safe. And as we will see, this one is not. Moving on, the watcher thread. Uh, it waits a little bit at the start. It waits for 500 milliseconds just to give the operating system chance to 
like set everything up. And the other uh, one is like a clock, right? It goes round and round and round. It doesn't really matter when we will um, start observing. We'll just, if, if we miss it by one uh, cycle, no matter, we'll just go. And also here, to be able to read the threshold value, we have to use an unsafe block. Another thing you have noticed, if we didn't copy it into threshold local, we would have to fetch it from the memory all the time for every time we access threshold local. So this is another hint that um, this is probably unsafe and probably not so stable as we have it here. We have no comments, not great. In production, if you use unsafe, always write a comment for the next person. And even if that next person is you in a couple of weeks, explain why this unsafe is necessary. And maybe in a couple of weeks, you'll re revisit this code and say, hmm, I can um, make this safe now and never have to worry about this doing weird stuff. Uh, also, threshold local is in the register again. So, okay. In the main thread, after the watcher has observed, I think it was a hundred or or something samples, it will uh, print how many it has recorded, and then it will also print the last part of the history, so we can see how big the runs are. And um, yeah, as I said before, one would expect naively that this would be like a, a small number, and on the, more importantly, a constant number like maybe one or two, because it's simpler to watch um, a value than to write the value. But um, this is what we get. We get 88, and then we, we have observed it once, and then we get 93, we have observed it once, and 98, so observed it just once, so this zero is how many repetitions we have. And we wanted to have I think it was 100,000 samples, and we only recorded um, 99,000 transitions. So this is like all over the place. But now we think, yeah, maybe it's just too slow, right? Maybe it misses it because it's debug mode, and debug mode is slow. So let's put it in release mode. Um, this is this is even worse. Now we don't see any transitions anymore. And um, you can guess now why, and I will go back to the code of the watcher thread. Why is this not recording any changes anymore? Having a sip of tea. Hmm. Patrick is typing. Also, someone has posted the uh, unroll crate and doxorus. So I don't see any uh, one proposing any answers. Anyhow, so the main problem is the compiler looks at this from a single threaded point of view and says, hmm, this thing here is a symbol that we see out here. And yes, compiler optimization, yes, is correct. So this one is a local symbol. This one is always the same, so we don't need this update anymore. And then this value will always be the same. So this is always true. So we can just increase the counts. This branch here gets discarded completely. And then we have max test, which just contains a count increment. The compiler is smart enough to transform this loop into just assigning the max value to count itself, and then it notices, oh, count is never read, actually. So it doesn't need count anymore. And then we see uh, last isn't read either. So we didn't need that anymore either. Uh, history, yeah, we still need that. We need to allocate that thing because the user forced me to, and then we have to give it back. And that's the end of the story. So the only thing that survives this is a huge allocation and a return statement. Um, not very obvious in, in this small code and get even worse in bigger code. So, um, yeah. So let's fix that. So we have the counter function, 
and uh, we say, hey, compiler, don't optimize this away. Yeah, uh, Vladimir just wrote in the chat that uh, Rust needs the volatile keyword and uh, we don't. We really don't want the volatile keyword. It's badly designed. It does mean different things in different C versions and it does mean different things in C++ and in C, although the same compiler compiled that code. Um, if we actually need volatile, then we have this read and write volatile pointer functions. And we can actually do stuff like that. And in this case, we don't get optimized away because the compiler knows, yeah, we have to touch the memory. Therefore, we have a side effect. And this uh, has to be like attributed to something. So this will actually write to the memory always. And then we get somewhat correct numbers. Oh, there's some slides missing. I'm really sorry. So uh, on the next slide, there should be something. Uh, hope fixing slides during talk. End frame. Why is this broken? Minted. Hmm. I'm really sorry, I have to read you the numbers from the source code um, because there is an entire segment missing here. Let's see. Um. Oh, no, it just reordered. Okay, never mind this chapter. Um, we just have some weird reordering. Hmm. I'm sorry. Um, now I'm confused. Okay, let's trust the slides. Um, so now we need atomic op operations. Really sorry for messing up light text. Um, so atomic access is uh, stuff that appears to the user of the CPU. Um, as one thing, like we cannot differentiate half access and whatnot. Um, there are some optimizations for that. That means uh, we have to pay attention to caches. We can do misaligned access, but it will be very slow. Uh, this is especially true if we have uh, bit flags that we have to check because we have to fetch and load the whole uh, block and then access the word and then have to perform and or operations onto the, the thing, and then we get the uh, bit we want, which is terribly inefficient. So um, another thing that most people are not aware of is that um, atomic operations also have uh, effects on memory reordering and instruction reordering. And, to make sure that this wor works properly on every CPU is very, very difficult because it's different. It's different uh, on AMD 64. It's mostly the same on Intel X uh, 86, 64, but it's different on 32 bit and it's definitely different on ARM. Depending on what ARM it is, it's very different. Sometimes we have reordering in, in the CPU, sometimes we don't. All of these things we have to keep in our head all the time we compile the program. So why not use an abstraction? Uh, this is the same about the log prefix. So these are, uh, the most important thing is actually the, the fat keywords down there. These are the assembler instructions that will behave differently uh, with the log prefix. And the log prefix is what our abstractions with atomic uh, variables and pointers and counters used to actually work for comparison, increment, decrement, not sub, whatever. All of these operations, we need CPU support. The hardware has to guarantee uh, atomic execution. And on AMD 64, it's called lock. But on the other uh, ISO, uh, sorry, on the other instruction sets, it's different. So. Oh yeah, I've almost forgot about this one. We have very different um, 
guarantees. So um, on Intel, Intel is very optimistic and everybody has heard of Spectre, I assume, and other side channel attacks. And it's buried in this number, how many cycles does it take? One cycle, for instance, if you increment one number single threaded, it's one cycle, pretty fast. Atomic operations, 20 to 120 cycles. It's not great, but it's still okay. The trade-off is, trade is worth it. But since Intel uh, was not able to implement AMD 64 instruction set back in the day, they emulated it. So uh, the CPU that is running Intel, um, C sorry, Intel CPUs are not running instruction sets in hardware like AMDs are. They are actually virtual machines that emulate the CPU and behave the same most of the time. That's why we need microcode updates all the time because Intel makes mistakes and they have to be fixed. AMD Opteron is the last platform I was able to get uh, solid numbers from. It's 40 cycles for every operation. Very deterministic, very nice for everybody that uh, relies on real-time systems. For the Ryzen and Epic, I haven't been able to get solid numbers uh, and I haven't had the time to measure it myself. So, but it will be roughly in the same neighborhood, if not better. So um, let's do a counter race again. So we have uh, 100K increments that we want to do around four parties and we want the four parties to increment this global counter. Uh, const is super because the compiler can insert that number into the various places and static means it's one field in memory and everybody knows where it is and we'll just write to this field. So, oh, um, for those of you that are new to Rust, this is more functional style. Uh, I'm really sorry if you're confused by the thing. Uh, so let me go quickly through the thing. So, you know, for symbol and then in, so we can do ranges. If you come from Python, for instance, you can say 4x in range colon, and then it will iterate over this range. This is the same thing. This is the syntax for it. One number, dot, dot, and one other number. We can also have inclusive range, then it's one number, dot, dot, equal, and then the other number. Brilliant. Why do we need brackets? Because if we put this dot map here, it would go to the second number. We don't want that. We want to have the range and then from this range on, we want to map. So range are iterable. So this is a for loop, That's, uh, sorry, yes, a for loop. And then we use map and then this i, and this i transforms uh, with this function into whatever we want. So we have underscore i, so we ignore the value. So we just want to have a for loop that runs as many times as we need. And then we spawn uh, frets. This is the closure that we spawn. Inside the closure, we uh, get the counter pointer because we need that. And then we use read volatile, sorry, this one read volatile to get the current value, increment it by one locally, and then write volatile back into the thing because we know where it is and we can do that. And it's unsafe because you shouldn't do that. So this is our setup. This is our spawn handlers. And then we use collect. Collect means everything that has been generated by the previous iterator, so these handlers of these functions, um, now we collect that into a vector. And because we cannot actually, um, well, with this time, in this case, we can't. This one is just laziness. So I don't want to say uh, what exact type this is. This would be join handler of a function that returns uh, something but I don't have to, I can just say underscore, figure it out compiler, I don't care. And then we use this little handy dandy thing, it's called into iter, which takes a container, an existing container, and iterates into the thing. Why do we do that here? The reason is we need to buffer all of the jobs because if we don't buffer them in this vector, 
then we will just spawn one at a time and process them um, just like in order. So they don't run concurrently. You don't want that. So uh, start all of them. At this point, all of them are started. And then once everything is started, we'll loop over what we have. And then we say, OK, for each, we uh, wait for the result. So we'll just wait for the first one, the second, and, and so on. And then, yeah, that, that's it. Because we operate on the global thing. And then we can ask ourselves, uh, how big is it? So we'll have to calculate the pointer again with this. And then we can just read it, read the pointer, read volatile, and say, OK, what we expected is how many parties we had times how many increments we wanted to do. And ta -tum. the result is pretty bad. It's way off. And the reason for that is sometimes, well, actually most of the times, because we're pretty close to the lower end, um, all four threads read the same value, do the same calculation, and write back the same value. If you're a little bit lucky, they get a little bit out of sync, and then the value starts to increase a little more than one thread would have done alone. So <clears throat> let's fix that. Let's use atomic use size. It's the same code, but instead of pointer magic, we just tell the Rust compiler, figure it out, make it work on this hardware. And we we'll say fetch add. And then this one is new, ordering. And I will get into this after a sip of tea. Pardon me. Oh, I haven't spoken that much in a long time. <laughs> I also see Carl has uh, the perfect reaction. It says it's fascinating, but way too low level. I agree for most people. This is probably true. Um, moving on. Ordering. If you come from C++, uh, they introduced the concept of ordering because there are different trade-offs when you write to stuff. Um, for instance, there is, you see this at the bottom, sequential consistent. This means we don't want memory reordering and we don't want instruction reordering. So at that point, when we load this thing, every code that has been above this has to be finished. Every memory read and write has to be finished at that point. That is great for stability, but it's pretty bad for speed. How bad, I will tell you later in the measurements. On the other hand, relaxed is fire and forget. So what you tell the, the CPU chip here is, yeah, uh, it doesn't really matter if I get reordered, as long as you don't lose the increment I'm doing. And that that's all the magic. There's uh, acquire and uh, store as well. So this means you don't care about, these are, these are like the two extremes, but relaxed and sequential consistent are the both ends of the spectrum. And in between there is more where you can say, I care about all the reads before the thing I do. And then there's one that I care all the writes before I do. And then there's one where I care about most of the read and writes before, but not about the location in uh, instruction reordering. Um, these are details. If you get into that, hire me. I mean, I have time for a project just studying in a master's degree. <laughs> All right. And now with fetch add and load, we get what we wanted. We have exact store. Uh, the runtime is comparable, if I remember correctly, but I don't have the numbers here. So. That's what we should do. Also, as you have, may have noticed, we don't have unsafe anymore. So it just works. Uh, by the way, if you're using a more recent compiler, atomic use is in it, this constant has been replaced by const generics code. So you can specify uh, a certain number at compile time. So we don't have to have uh, an init function that runs before our main that then sets the atomic value to a certain thing if it if this value is not zero. 
So we can just write it into the code and put it to 42 or whatever we need. So cache lines. So why was this so, um, why did I build up to this? Oh, there's a question in the chat. So not Matthias says, what's the difference between the atomic group and mutexes? Um, a mutex is a pretty complex thing, which you can build out of atomics. So what you can do is you can have an atomic uh, counter and an atomic pointer, which is, let's be honest, basically the same thing. So, um, then you, if you want to access the mutex, you increment the counter value of the mutex and say, hey, uh, this is me now, I want to access the thing. And then you have to check again that no one else has changed the mutex. And then uh, if not, you can access the value safely. And when you unlock it, you can decrement the counter. Um, this lock is a really bad one. So the real mutex is a little more complex. Also, this is relatively slow. Uh, but if we don't have an operating system, that's how we are going to operate. We have to have uh, an atomic linked list. Linked lists in Rust usually really bad. So this time, um, yeah, we need it as a queue. And then we have this atomic queue where everybody that wants to acquire the mutex has to operate on this atomic queue. And then we have to create these data structures, uh, add ourselves to the list, see that no one else has manipulated the list in a way that we don't like. And um, then check if we are at the head of the list. And if we are, we can access the value and manipulate it. And if we are done with the list, we can uh, remove ourselves from the list and point the thing to something else. And then we have to actually wait for a bit until hardware flushes out the cache information and then we can free the thing. Otherwise we have a uh, use after free potentially in another thread. Uh, and if you think this is insane, who would write such a complicated thing? Um, that's actually how the Linux uh, USB driver stack works with just writing stuff around in memory and waiting a little bit in the hopes that no one has access to it. And then there is a value in the documentation. If you acquire any structure from the USB uh, kernel driver stack inside the kernel, you're allowed to hold it for, I think, four seconds or something like that. And then you have to let go. Maybe it's less nowadays. Um, so yeah, the point uh, being, uh, hot plug is hard and doing that stuff in C is harder and that's the solution they came up with. So, um, oh yeah, before, before we move on, there's another cool uh, crate called parking lot and that leverages operating system support. So what modern big CPUs can, so the bigger ARMs and the AMD 64 CPUs and also the big Intel ones, of course, they have um, memory areas that we can uh, add callbacks to. And if we access them or write to them, we get a trap. So that's uh, a thing that we, so we get an, a virtual interrupt from the CPU and then we can react to that. And that technique can be used to build mutexes. They're called footex that are faster than the traditional mutex because we leverage the hardware support, but doesn't work on all platforms and usually requires operating system support, but it's really cool and it's really fast. Uh, look into parking lot if you're interested. So, <clears throat> cache lines, taking another sip. Our CPU is great. Let's be honest, it's a marvel of technology. Whenever you think computers are shite, um, think again, think about how many things a CPU can do, how fast it is, and with what dumb instructions we have to feed it, and it still makes stuff fast, right? You can, I, I have uh, spoken to a professor a couple of years back where he said like, yeah, it's no fun with these modern CPUs with the instruction reordering and the memory reordering uh, because 
even if the if you have the worst assembler code, these new i back in the day i7, this new i7, so this was right 20 10 ish. These i7s are bad because they reorder your really bad assembler code and make it performant, and you don't even see why. So there's no point in optimizing assembler anymore. And there's just like, yay. <laughs> so they actually canceled that class uh, because the last time they had hardware that was old enough that would not do instruction reordering and memory reordering was with these old 8086 uh, 32 bit CPUs, single core, really old. Like they don't need a cooler, they are that old. They're like this big, like a AAA battery and they run at uh, I think 80 megahertz, but that's already overclocked. So default clock is 40. So focusing back, I'm sorry, because <laughs> otherwise this gets too long. So we have one NUMA node in my machine, or bigger machines have multiple. We have L3 cache. It's, this is the cache that the latest Ryzen uh, generation has a lot of, uh, like I think 16 megabytes instead of four for a laptop CPU, which is great, it improves performance. Then we have L2. We can see here our core complex has uh, two uh, uh, PUs and uh, these two share one L2 and then we have an L1 data cache and an L1 instruction cache. That's important because the instruction cache with um, programs that are linear in flow, like have this instruction, that, 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 they uh, feed a lot of instructions while the data stays mostly the same. On the other hand, if we have a program that is uh, fast but runs in a loop, like for uh, graphics calculation, instructions are usually the same, but the data gets fed through really fast. So we need to have these two caches that are independent um, and the data cache is uh, smaller in, in my CPU. These caches grow with every generation because usually it's the easiest way to improve performance by 10-ish percent if you double these caches. And that's uh, what manufacturers will keep doing because uh, clock speeds are at the limit. We cannot go above five gigahertz without super special cooling. Uh, I've seen some sub-zero cooling uh, now, but let's be honest, if we waste 500 watts on cooling solution <clears throat> and then another 300 watts on our CPU, that just blows our energy budget for everything. So we cannot use that. Uh, the solution is more cores as we see with this laptop and bigger caches. Moving on, uh, this is a more colorful diagram. This one's from AMD. So we see the instruction cache here, and this one gets fed by branch prediction. That's what I said with instruction reordering. Um, <clears throat> instruction reordering is before that, then is branch prediction. So the CPU actually calculates both branches of your if, and then does uh, operations caching, and then micro op queue. So this means AMD also starts using virtual infrastructure inside the CPUs. Uh, it's faster, but I really hope they don't overdo it because in the end we will end up with uh, Spectre on AMD and Meltdown and all these not so fun things that will um, make our lives really, really, really bad and compromise security in the, at the end of the day. Um, there's also a chance that there will be a new command at some point where we can just say, from here on out, stop optimizing. Just be a dumb CPU, even if we lose performance of 40% or 50%. We don't care. We don't want anything weird happen until there's this other flag that comes on and says, yeah, from now on, on it's application code. It's not security uh, relevant anymore. You may optimize and uh, decode in any uh, <clears throat> in any fashion you want. Also, um, what's not shown on this diagram is the decoder and the op cache. They uh, instruct the memory uh, prefetcher. So the prefetcher will actually fetch memory that's not used by your program yet. But the uh, algorithm is like, yeah, there's a good chance it will be used soon. 
So let's fetch it from the memory because the memory is really slow. Um, another fun fact for the CPU, this part that we see on this diagram, uh, the cache is mostly transparent. So it does not see the difference between L1, 2, 3, and memory just operates on the thing. And the memory prefetcher will fetch stuff from the memory over L3 into 2 into L1. And then the actual compute units, the orange and the red here in the middle, will then do their work. There's other compute units. And this would be another talk on what you can and cannot do with all of that. So. <clears throat> Whew, measuring this, it's its insane, right? So many things, it's just between two instructions and you usually never have to think about it. Um, but one common thing is if you have performance counters, um, you may use them with, uh, what's its name? Um, Prometheus, right? There's a, a Prometheus crane, we can say, okay, here is a bunch of mem uh, um, counters I want to measure, I don't know, how many requests I get in my web server per, I don't know, second or in total, uh, maybe per root, right? You have main page, some API call, some other API call, and you maybe want to measure how much time does it take to uh, fulfill all these requests, how many are authenticated, all of that. That amounts to a pretty significant number of counters and now we'll dive into what happens if we store these numbers too close to each other. Um, yeah, so let's build a test. By the way, this is the test harness. This is built into Rust Nightly. Um, you can uh, uh, create the file. Let me quickly show this to you. Uh, why is this not working? Oh. So, so we have our project here. Oh, by the way, this is EXA for the people that don't use it. It's very colorful. And then we say in this Rust toolchain file, nightly. So that means all the cargo commands that we uh, that we issue will automatically get redirected to nightly. If we exit this folder and use cargo there, it's whatever else we have. In my case, this is stable. So I can recommend that for um, measurement projects like this, just as a side note. Um, black box is a really handy function because it tells the compiler, don't optimize this away. Like don't touch it, just treat it as random input output. We really need that. Um, we have a difference between relaxed and sequential consistent. I will show you the measurements afterwards. Uh, yeah. There's some unsafe magic because I'm using some trade magic to <coughs> swap out the, the things I want to uh, show to you. Uh, let's see if I can show you the code real quick. What source main? So this is the trait, these are the counters, and then these are the tests, they're called bench. And I have this type argument that uh, then gets matched by a constructor and then the work gets done. So moving on. Each structure has eight fields because I designed this test for up to eight CPUs. I only have eight and yeah just increasing the number by the alphabet is, is a boring task. So A is zero, B is one, and so on. Normal is just atomic use sizes all the way. Then we have alignment. So we align the whole structure by 64 um, bit, bytes, pardon me. That means we will start at a cache line, right? So when the compiler, um, allocate space for that thing in memory, it will start at a cache line. This means it will not lap over uh, some cache lines because the smaller structure may fit in the first half in the first cache line and the second half in the second. And this will cost us performance again. We don't want that. And the third structure is everything is aligned, like the structure itself and the fields itself. So each 
member has its own cache line. Uh, here you see dot dot equal from the ranges. So if we just run one thread, it's like eight milliseconds per execution. That's not bad. And then two gets it gets worse, right? And then it gets really bad. Um, so okay, let's let's just make sure that it's aligned. Okay, let's it's align it so it starts the same, but apart from that, <clears throat> there's not much difference, right? So the, the small numbers change, but the big ones are basically the same. Um, what is if we have cache line awareness? Interesting, isn't it? Right? So we lose hardly any time anymore because the CPU is actually able to access different parts, different caches. And uh, I'm really sad that that's like, pew, fireworks. That's it. Uh, if we look at the, the numbers combined, that's it. In this uh, case, we save a factor of 10 with eight cores. And that's great. If you have a bigger CPU, this number will only get better. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry for everybody who's like, oh, and now this is it. Um, yeah, if we order differently, if we have ordering relaxed, I hinted it before, see these numbers? They come down a lot, like a lot, a lot. Because now we can tell the CPU, yeah, just whatever, right? We don't need you to interrupt your memory prefetching. And this test is backed by, uh, I think, 100K entries that we, so we allocate an array, one block of memory with 100K entries. And then depending on the kind, we will access them overlapped or in different cache lines and we actually gain speed a lot like remember this one the first cache line ever it's like 8.7 always unless it's normal with relaxed we are faster even with eight uh, cores working on these numbers so the takeaway here is if you have performance counters always always use ordering relaxed because otherwise you will interrupt the, I'm sorry, I went to head to the conclusion. You will interrupt the, the program flow, the memory optimization so badly by your measurements that you will distort whatever you're measuring too much to have any like relevant data. Yeah, other conclusions. We need atomic operations for many things. Uh, there are lots of great crates. Standard library is one of the big ones that uh, abstract away all of these things. It frees our heads from the burden of thinking about all of this stuff. I, I think most of you heard um, about this stuff the first time. Uh, just be happy uh, that someone else took care of this with an abstraction and you can manage other problems than like running around and handling individual threats, just use a pool or think about which hardware capabilities your program has to use to be able to run or not. The compiler will just tell you. And with that, um, opening to questions. Uh, yes, Patrick. Hello. Yeah, there is still one question. You already answered a lot of them, but mm -hmm. not Matthias uh, still has one question. Yes. Is there any reason to not cache align everything? I guess the performance will drop when doing that. Um, you that? I can answer that question. So my demo project here <clears throat> has, uh, let me make this a little bigger. It has also a normal run mode. Actually, I should uh, should be a good citizen and show you the release mode. So this is the size. How big is everything? Atomic use size, eight bytes, right? Eight times eight, 64 bits. Yeah. That's what we expect. If you align 
the structure like eight fields with uh, eight um, f things, then it's 512 yeah. bytes long. So it's half a kilobyte for one data structure. And the others that are normally aligned are just 64 bytes. So that's the trade-off, right? We trade space for speed. Uh, right, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. I really loved your talk. It was amazing. I'm really into performance talks and I, I loved it a lot. It was